Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we're taking you through the best bits of Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. No subtitle, mate. He doesn't need it. I think if you look back in if you look back in history, you know, 80 years ago or so, Henry Ford's probably the man that sticks out. I think in 80 years' time, when you look back, Steve Jobs is going to be the guy that everyone remembers. It's the creation myth at large. If you think about the the mythology of someone launching a startup in your parents' garage and building it into one of the world's most valuable companies, he didn't invent anything outright, but he was the master of putting together ideas, art and technologies in ways that invented the future. I'm sure uh, everybody knows who Steve Jobs is, but just as a bit of an overview of some of his accomplishments, just to get your appetite warmed up for the episode that is to come. Firstly, you know, Apple II, that was the thing that where he took Steve Wozniak's board and turned it into the very first personal computer that was fully integrated. Macintosh popularized graphical user interfaces, as well as being at Apple, he was also at Pixar, which brought you the massive blockbuster of Toy Story and opened up the entire miracle of digital imagination. The Apple stores where he reinvented the role of a store and used that as the cornerstone of their brand. The iPod changed the way we listen to music. iTunes saved the music industry. The iPhone turned mobile phones into much more than that. The App Store spawned an entire new entrepreneurial avenue. The iPad launched tablet computing iCloud became a new way for file storage and then obviously Apple itself at one point became the most valuable company in the world. For most creations around the world, you'd think that no man is or woman is bigger than their actual company. But I think it's a little bit different with Steve Jobs. He's very unique in the way he was able to mobilize his teams to achieve things that were just on the cusp of what seems possible. So it was because he has a, a really unique story and that's what we're going to be covering today. We're going to be going in chronological order, going from his childhood, what are some of the things that shaped him, and then the very start of his journey with uh, Steve Wozniak, starting from the parents' garage, moving through the wild successes he had and how he got there and and the way his brain was wired in these certain ways. Then also the big fall that he had. He fell into the, the, the belly of the whale, you could say. And then beyond that, he came back and then basically created all the products that really changed the world and uh, learned from all the downtimes that he had throughout his life. Okay, so we'll start where most books start, and that's at the start. And uh, before Steve even got to school, he was already able to read, which is you know pretty well developed for a young child, but it meant that he was a, a socially awkward loner. Because he was sort of too far ahead of his peer group, he wasn't able to socially integrate with the rest of the kids. Instead of listening to the teacher and trying to learn how to read, which he already knew, he was off doing his own thing, often getting in trouble and couldn't relate to the other students. Now, school's the first time he encountered authority, albeit at a very early age. He said, I encountered authority of a different kind that I never encountered before and I did not like it. And they really almost got me. They came close to beating any curiosity out of me. Mm. It really strikes a chord with a lot of the books that we read that, that we are taught through a school, the school system a lot of the time to be a cog and not be someone and, and chasing your curiosity. But Steve, luckily from the very start, he didn't turn into a cog that actually just fit into the machine and be like everybody else. Yeah, we, we often hear that students enter school as a question mark and then leave as a, as a full stop. I forget which book that was from, but there's a lot of people that say how their, their education system is still training us up to be factory workers of the old old school system compared to what the new world requires. So he was already on the outs when he started school and then in the fourth grade he actually skipped a year so he's now even further on the outs. He's trying to integrate with a new group of kids a year older than him so he's younger, he's already a loner and it's just got even worse. Steve's first exposure to electronics was through his father who was an auto mechanic And in the cars, there was a bit to do with the electronics inside it. And he learned some technical skills from his father, but also from the very start, he realized that he was a great negotiator. And that was because he knew better than the guys at the accounter what parts should actually cost. So I guess the seeds of some of his business skills was was learned from his father. But then again, one day he had a disagreement with his father. And on that day, he realized that he's actually smarter than his parents. So still at a very young age, and he's just breaking it further and further away and being more detached from his peers and family. So he's already started to question schooling. He started to question his his parents thinking he's smarter than his parents. Next, he started to question the religious aspects he'd been brought up with as well. He saw a, a picture in a magazine of a starving child. So he asked 
the the person who the church pastor who ran his Sunday school. You know, does does God know all of these things? Does he know that this is going on? And then he jobs even asks, you know, if I raise my finger, will God know which one I raise before I even do it? And the pastor says, Yes, God knows this, God <laughs> knows everything. And so that was pretty much the day when Job thought, There's no way I'm gonna worship a God who knows everything that's going on and is still letting children starve. So that's when he started to rebel against the religious aspects he'd brought been brought up with as well. And put all this together, he was also adopted by his parents. So I guess the, the, the one rhyme in his upbringing that he was an outsider, which does relate to some of his marketing messages that he has around Apple, uh, directing it to the rebels and the misfits of society, just because that is exactly who he was growing up. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, shift though. So he was obviously a social outcast. And we've talked about how he didn't fit in with everybody else. He was bullied a lot. The kids used to tease him and say, obviously, your real parents didn't want you. But his adoptive parents tried to twist that narrative as much as possible to shift it to, no, it wasn't that your parents didn't want you. It was that we specifically picked you. So there's a big difference there between not being wanted versus being specifically chosen because you are special. So at this stage, he knew what his curiosity was, and that was in electronics. And he made a, a very good friend at this stage as well who had the same curiosity in electronics, and that was Steve Wozniak. Now, Woz was five years older than Jobs, but he was emotionally and socially still a high school geek, whereas Jobs, as we've been saying, he acted a few years above his age. They, they matched well in terms of their emotional maturity, but also in their curiosity. Now, Woz, he was actually the school legend and the teacher's all-time favorite for his wizardry in class and his knowledge around electronics. So these two Steves came together, they hit it off with their big dreams about doing something different and they dreamt of building their first blue box. Now, this blue box was something that a lot of people had talked about but no one knew if it was really possible or not. This blue box was a, a type of machine that they could build and what it would allow them to do would be you know, things like bypassing the toll collection booths or if you hooked it up to your telephone, it would allow you to make long distance calls for free. Basically, no one had really ever done it before, but they thought it was an exciting challenge. So this was their first invention, albeit quite small relative to what they were to do later, but it was really a milestone in their relationship. It paved the way for what would be a bigger adventure together in the future. So if it hadn't been for these blue boxes they did at the very start as their first mini side project, then all the inventions that came in the future wouldn't have been. Because was he was a gentle wizard coming up with a neat invention and he would be happy to give it away, right? He was just happy to just be the engineer inventing something really cool and then just giving it out for free. But then Jobs would figure out how to make it user-friendly, work on the interface, package it up, market it, and then also make a few bucks in the process. So we've got the seeds of a great partnership here, two guys who are similar in some aspects but also different enough that they add to each other's strengths to make a great, a great duo. They both move on to university or college and as you can probably expect Steve Jobs very quickly became bored he was again complaining about the rigid structures and the authority he was saying that people they're making me take all of these courses so he actually refused to go to any of the classes he was supposed to go to and he said he just dropped into other random classes he went to dance class where he could express a bit of creativity but probably more importantly he could meet some girls and do some dancing with them and really he just refused to accept any of these automatic truths that everybody else went along with he was always questioning the default always looking to examine the reasons why and if he didn't agree with them he just went off and did his own thing yeah i think if you came across steve jobs at this age at university you think a bit of a bit of a dropkick loser not getting mm. good grades walking around in bare feet stunk bit of an odd dude going to a dance class and eastern mysticism and all this kind of stuff he even later said in his famous Stanford commencement address, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here I was spending all the money my parents had saved for me their entire life. So I decided to drop out and trust it would work out okay. It's a fair amount of confidence to obviously be able to drop out and think, you know, I'll just figure it out later. But at the same time, it's also somewhat risky to think, okay, this is what I'm going to do forever. These are the skills I need to develop. They're going to serve me for the rest of my life. So I'm just going to commit to it and, and also, I guess, hope that it works out in the long run. Yeah, there's a mix of his selfishness but also self-belief. Mm. And, you know, probably in the short term, you think he's being a bit of a dick. But in the long term, with the benefit of hindsight, it, it works out to be the best decision. One of those random classes he dropped in on, which is going to come back later in a big way in his career down the track, was a calligraphy class. 
Now, normally you'd think it's, it's pretty weird for a computer geek to go to a calligraphy class, but he saw you know, all these beautiful drawings, all these beautiful typefaces, and that's where he really learned about the difference between, I guess, what looks good and what doesn't look good. He learned the difference about serif fonts versus sans serif fonts. Why would you use each one? When would you use each one? Where would you use each one? He learned about the difference between the spaces between letters. It was all these sort of things that when you're a 19-year-old college student probably seem random and unimportant, but it's just another little arsenal that he added to his toolkit that came back to help later on. Yes, you could say he was building uncorrelated skill stacks. That at the time, you couldn't see any long-term vision of these things coming together, which inevitably they obviously did, as we all know. So he went around barefoot most of the time, rented a garage for 20 bucks a month, and basically it was just on the quest for spiritual enlightenment. He said, our consciousness was raised by Zen and taking LSD. LSD was a profound experience, one of the most important of my life. It shows you that there's another side to the coin, and you can't remember when it wears off, but you know it. It reinforced my sense of what was important, creating things instead of making money, putting things back in the stream of history and of human consciousness as much as I could. So he was taking loads of LSD. He also went to India on his spiritual quest, and he had this attitude, right? He's obviously a nonconformist following his own curiosity, and he had the attitude that he could do anything, and therefore so could you. And that's what he, he relayed on everybody he came across at his early stage. It was the brighter side of what would become known as his reality distortion field, which we'll talk about later. If you trust him, then you can do things. If he's decided that something should happen, then he's going to make it happen. So, so far he's been trying a lot of different things, sampling a lot, but he hasn't got a clear path in front of him. When he gets back from India... He sees a job ad that caught his eye. The job ad was just four simple words, have fun, make money. Now, they're two pretty good things when you're looking for a job. And so, he walked into the guy's office. It turns out it was Atari, so he was working in tech, which is the direction he wanted to head in. He walked straight into the director's office. He had this long hair, really shabby attire. He whacked his feet up on the desk and said, look, I'm not leaving here until you give me a job. (laughs) Yeah, it just shows the absolute boldness that he had in his character. I think uh, a lot of people, right, if you want a job and if you just rocked up and were bold and asked for your job, it's so uncomfortable to do, <laughs> but I think the strike rate is going to be much higher than someone, say if you're a graduate looking to find an employer, um, doing your CV is such a low percentage chance of doing mm. it. I think going the job style is probably the way to go. <laughs> it's a big risk. You need to have the confidence and self-belief to be able to pull it off. But if you can pull it off, I'd say it's an extremely high strike rate compared to walking around and just dropping your resume in. Maybe keep your shoes on, I like jobs. <laughs> but yeah, take <laughs> a, shower a shower and <laughs> whack some deodorant on. Uh, so jobs from this, he becomes one of the first 50 employees at Atari, but he's a super low-level technician. He's working for five bucks an hour. But the good thing is he got in without a degree, so everybody else had wasted a couple of years at uni, whereas he just went off on his spiritual journey and came back and was really at the same spot as everybody else. He, again, he had this high amount of self-confidence and self-belief that he became impossible to deal with. He was calling all the people around him dumb shits. He was saying he was better than everyone else. And he says, when he was looking back, he says, I really shone there because everybody else was so bad. Yeah, he had that polarizing character and throughout his whole entire life. You know, you hear off a lot of people that Steve Jobs was an absolute dick. Uh, I think it's just one of those examples of where someone's (laughs) biggest strengths can also be their, their biggest weaknesses. But at Atari, he really had one of his big breakout moments because they were trying to create a game called Pong and Jobs was obviously very bright. So the boss brought Jobs into the office and asked if him and Steve Wozniak could design it and if they did, they could split the earnings. So a little side project for them. And when Jobs told Woz, he was thrilled because he could go out and design a game that other people would use. Yeah, this was that that game I'm sure everyone's familiar with where there's on one side of the screen, the, the paddle goes you can move it up and down and the ball shoots up across the other side and it bounces back, sort of like a, a bit of table tennis almost, but the digital format. Atari had been trying to crack this. They hadn't been able to develop it. They hadn't been able to make that two-sided game before. Woz was thrilled by this and Steve actually didn't tell Woz, hey, this is something they've been working on. They haven't been able to do it before. He actually just said to Woz, we've got a deadline. It's due in four days. Can you do it? He didn't say this is impossible. He didn't say no one's done it before. He just said, it's due in four days. They work pretty hard. They, they crack some things that nobody else had been able to crack and astonishingly they were able to pull it off within the four day made up deadline that steve jobs completely made up they were able to pull it off and get it done yeah he says the game would have taken most engineers months 
but because of this reality distortion field, it was only four days working overnight, mind you, but they still got it done. There were all kind of movements happening at, in the 70s. You had Zen and Hinduism, meditation and yoga, primal scream and sensory deprivation. It was the fusion of flower power, enlightenment and technology. And this was all really embodied by Steve Jobs. He kind of represented all of these things in the one character. He meditated in the mornings. He dropped in physics classes in the day. He worked nights at Atari and he dreamt of starting his business. Steve Jobs, when he looked back on his life, he said he really felt like there was something going on there. He felt like there was some kind of movement brewing that it was a really important time in, in history, a really important time to, to seize and start to make your own. And this was when the, the computing shift was beginning to, to go underway. Some people were dismissing it as a tool of just bureaucratic control, whereas others were embracing it as a symbol of individual expression and liberation. It's interesting, if you dropped in in that moment in history, who would have thought that the people who invented the 21st century were these pot-smoking, sandal-wearing hippies from the West Coast like Steve. It was simply just because they saw it differently to how things were done back then. All the hierarchical systems didn't apply to his, his way of thinking. So Steve and Steve, the two, the two Steves, they've, they've had a, a few wins along the way so far. They've made their little blue box. They've been able to create Pong. Then what they did next was they thought, okay, let's go to the next level here. They thought they're going to start their own company. So Jobs had this fancy calculator. He sold it for 500 bucks. Was sold his Volkswagen for a grand and a half. So together they put their money together, had some working capital. They had a few ideas. So now they had a company. I don't know why Was had to put in three times as much, but... Yeah, I think that's the, and he the, didn't, the wrong. He didn't get three times as much at the end of it. Yeah, <laughs> at this at the very start of their career, was was the smart guy doing all the work, and yeah, <laughs> and Jobs was just the guy paying less and just uh, giving giving I guess the drive and the vision for was to step into. So they came up with the Apple computer, the first one, and it was when he was one on one of his fruitarian diets. So it sounded fun, spirited, and not intimidating. So this is what Jobs did. He went on diets where it was just pure fruit. So just eat apples for a few weeks. Mm. He said that just eating fruit meant that he wouldn't emit any body odor. But if you ask the people around him, they'd strongly disagree with that (laughs) statement. The fruit was doing nothing to help. Yeah, so the thinking around Apple, the name, it took the edge off the word computer and it was actually ahead of Atari in the phone book. Mm. So it's not the computer that we think of today. It was just basically they got some orders in to just put together some circuit boards and fully assemble them at $500 a piece and this is what Apple was at the very start. Yeah, it was. The next step after that was they they were saying, look, you know, circuit boards and bits and pieces that people, all these computer nerds have to build themselves are sort of somewhat interesting at the moment but the next step is to make it easier for the the non-tech heads to use and to do that, that's where you need to be able to integrate everything together so it's not just the bits and pieces it's not just the circuit board you need to have this great case where you can add a keyboard you can add a screen you can add the circuit board you can put them all together and they all need to have this power source and it's really the next level evolution of computing that can take it to the the next step on that you know the adoption curve that we've we've spoken about before so you got those hobbyists who are the very far left hand side of the curve and they don't mind a little bugs, they're happy to assemble and invest their own time and energy into help putting into this new product. But really there's not many people there. They're completely vital to getting to the mass market. But jobs, that's where he wanted to head into. He wanted to get the earlier adopters and the early majority. And these people, they're not happy to spend their time on it. They want a fully end-to-end kind of integrated system that you just pull out of the box, you put it on the desk, and it just starts solving your own problems. And no one had cracked this early adopter, early majority market. At this stage, there was only hobbyists playing with computers and no one really had it on their desk. And this is what Steve Jobs' vision was at this very early stage. Your Joe Blows, your your Tracy and Susans. (laughs) And his vision was to hit the mass market and he went around trying to raise venture capital. No one was really super keen on this idea. I suppose that the people with money were the older people who might not have that intuition or feeling for the historical moment that Jobs could see right in front of him. The people with the money were thinking, what's this whole computer bizzo doing? All all these nerds in their garages whacking up circuit boards and putting wires together and trying to make something. Well, not only that, man. Imagine just not just the vision of the computer, but also the the delivery from the person. If someone's rocking up, he stinks (laughs) completely and he's got bare feet. I mean, and you're going to trust him with all your money. And he's a dickhead. (laughs) 
Well, thankfully, after slogging away, slogging away, getting no, getting no, getting no, hell of a lot of rejections. People not wanting to talk to him. If they did, they didn't understand what the hell he was trying to talk about. Finally, there's this dude called Mike Markler who bought into the idea. He actually, they were able to convince him that uh, Mike Markler, he would invest 250000 He'd invest, more, probably more importantly, his mentorship to be able to bring it from two dudes in a garage into a real viable company. And in return, he got a one-third equity stake of Apple Computers. So now Apple was a real company. They went out and hired a dozen employees. They had a line of credit and they had the daily pressures of all the customers and suppliers. So they went out of the garage that they started it all in and went into rented offices. So where we've come so far, we've got two dudes... They met in high school. They were doing a few little small projects together. Eventually, they thought, let's have a real crack at it. They sold their calculator and they sold their car to get a few grand to be able to make a few circuit boards and sell to the tech nerds. They were in their mum's garage. They weren't really that serious. They had a great idea, but everyone was saying no to them. Everyone was rejecting them. No one wanted to give them money. No one even understood what the hell they were talking about. Thankfully, they get this one dude, this Mike Markle guy who gives them a bit of money, gives them some structure and some rigor and some mentorship and eventually they're able to create this real genuine revolutionary product it's something completely brand new that the world hadn't seen before they were able to bring it to life so thinking about steve jobs to this stage he's been walking around in bare feet going india taking lsd uh he's obviously very very smart at what he does but everyone else looking at him you're thinking he's just a wild drop kick 99.99% of the world doesn't believe in his vision, but he had a vision that he's actually going to be someone who's going to change the world. So he has built up this product and really don't know what people are going to, how they're going to respond to this product. But it turns out this was the first product that he made that actually did change the world. There was 6 million sold over 16 years and really more than any other machine at that time, it launched the whole personal computer industry took it out of the hands of the hobbyists, the tech enthusiasts, and put it on the desks of the people like you and me who actually use computers today. Obviously, he was. He gets a lot of historical credit for designing the wild, inspiring circuit board, which allowed for operating software and was one of the era's greatest feats of just solo invention by was. So they've tasted their first real, real big success here. In 1977, when they first started this journey... They valued their company at $5,307. That's when they, that was just their, I guess, arbitrary made up number when they first kicked it off. But four years later, they decided to take it public. So by the end of 1980, when they went public, Apple was valued at $1.8 billion. So that's a pretty serious growth over four years. <laughs> in, that, in that process of building up the company and all the initial employees that came in and got stocks along the way, 300 people became millionaires overnight when they went public. And at the age of 25, Steve Jobs himself was now worth overnight when they went public, $256 million. It's pretty unbelievable, isn't it? Fuck, I just realized I'm 26. Seven. Mate, Mate, don't, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Mate, you could be Steve Jobs. I reckon you're sleeping Jobs. Oh, it's too late. I've missed the boat. He, he did about 25. Yeah. Anyway, you'll get there, mate. <laughs> but obviously, that's a huge success, right, in a very quick turnaround. And we briefly did mention something about the reality distortion field. But if you think about what's the difference between us and yourself, mm. Ash Joe and <laughs> me and Jobs and everyone else and Jobs. And one of the things is probably the reality distortion field. In his presence, reality is malleable. So he can convince anyone of practical anything, even if it's complete bullshit. And when he's away from you, when he's not around, it makes it hard to have the realistic schedules. So it was dangerous to get caught in his distortion field, but it was literally what led him to change reality. I've been in the presence of someone who's got a distortion field before. It was my old footy coach and one time I had a sprained ankle and uh, I knew the team was short so I went up to him and said, hey mate, I can't play this weekend and then after that it turned out I was going to play two quarters <laughs> and I walked away thinking, what the hell just happened? I've got a hurt ankle, I'm meant to have three weeks off. Yeah. The similar thing with jobs here, you'd come up with an excuse why I think something couldn't be done or a, a schedule and then jobs, he would distort the whole reality field when you're around him and then you walked out thinking, what the hell just happened? Yeah, so I don't know if this reality distortion field, if it exists in his mind or if he's just like a, a bullshit artist or he doesn't know what the hell is going on, but what it really is is like the confound, like bringing all these different things together. It's a mix of his 
charismatic style. It's his mix of being able to dominate people. It's his bluntness. It's his personality that doesn't... He's not a pushover, but he can easily push other people over. And what he does is he's, he's able to bend the, the facts, I guess, to fit his own narrative. And he bends the facts to fit the purpose at, it, at hand. Yeah, it's not all upside. Like later when we learned that he, when he first learned he had cancer and was diagnosed with it, his own reality distortion field made himself mm. believe that the cancer didn't even exist. Or he can beat it. He had these other ways to beat it. Other ways to beat it. And in reality, you can't confront the cold hard facts. He's got a funny story here of one day, Larry Kenyon, he was working on the Mac operating system. Jobs thought it took way too long to boot up. I mean, Jobs probably didn't know what the technical answer was, but Kenyon was starting to explain, being the expert, uh, why it didn't. But then Jobs cut him off. He said, if you could save a person's life, would you find a way to shave 10 seconds off his boot time? He asked. And Kenyon said, look, if it's going to save someone's life, I'll f- I could find a way. <laughs> but then <laughs> Jobs went to the whiteboard and he showed that if there are 5 million people on this every day, it saved 300 million hours or so per year. And that's how much time people would save which was the equivalent of saving 100 lifetimes per year. <laughs> so, mate, this just little engineer, Kenyon, he's been told he can save 100 lives per year. Kenyon yeah. all of a sudden got to work. Well, that's it. By uh, If you add that all up, the, the math makes sense. I don't know if it directly computes to, you know, if you save 10 seconds and you can save 100 people's lives, but I guess you can't really dispute those facts. But what happened was big bad Kenyon, he went to work. He actually didn't shave 10 seconds off. He shaved 28 seconds off. Mm. So he had a way of motivating everyone by looking at the bigger picture and the goal was never to beat the competition or make a lot of money. It was about to do the greatest thing you could imagine possible and even a little greater than that. Jobs later said that by expecting his team to do great things, you could eventually get people to do great things. The original Mac team, he said that he only dealt with the A-plus players. The A-plus players were the ones who were able to see this great vision and work hard towards it. They weren't accepting... The limits are always pushing the boundaries. Jobs said he didn't, he didn't tolerate any of those B-grade players. And if they, he started to see anyone slipping down a B-grade, he'd quickly get rid of them because it wasn't worth the pain of trying to drag along a, a weakling when you can just have the best. So he had the reality distortion feel, but he was also obsessed with design more so than his competitors. So he repeatedly emphasized that Apple's products would be very clean, very simple. He make them bright, pure, and honest about being high-tech. And the way he ran the company, the product design, the advertising, it all came down to this. Make it very, very simple, as simple as you possibly can. He's famous for the quote, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. The main thing in our design is that we have to make things intuitively obvious. As his design sensibilities evolved, he became particularly attracted to the Japanese style, very clean, very neat, very simple, straight lines. And he also had the influence from his early calligraphy classes back at school. And he liked the different types of typeface. He liked the idea that users would be able to have a bit more control. It wasn't just the, the computer code where you got one type of font and that was the only way you could do it. He liked the idea of having different types and different styles and different typefaces and different typographies that you could use so that you weren't just you know, coding into a computer, it really opened computers up to all different si- sorts of designs and artists. Yeah, those days when he was learning Eastern mysticism and calligraphy and Buddhism and all these things, like he's famous for that quote, you can't connect the dots going forward, you can only looking back. He was collecting all these dots at the very start of his career and at this stage it actually aligned this special unique skill stack that was allowed Steve Jobs to build these Apple products and change the world in this certain way. It went a little bit too far. Some people might say that his extreme obsessiveness with simplicity, cleanliness and beautiful design, it went beyond just how the things looked from the outside. It also went into how things were on the inside. So the engineers, they'd be coming up with new ways to cram more stuff into the case but on the inside, it looked like shit. There was wires everywhere. There was different things everywhere. And, and Jobs just said, there's no way I can sleep at night if it looks like this. So even on the inside, it had to look clean and beautiful and perfect. So he forced his engineers to come up with new ways to make it look good, even though nobody was ever going to see inside the machine. Yeah. Another unconventional thing he did compared to everyone else was just believe that the customer can be wrong. Like well, all these competitors might be out there doing market research about everyone wants and then build what the customer wants. I mean, that makes just intuitive sense to a lot of people. But he decided to do things like eliminate the cursor, arrow keys on the Macintosh keyboard. 
and the only way to move it now was the mouse. And at the time, everyone's used to using the cursor keys to move the, the cursor. So you'd be pretty pissed off when someone takes it and brings <laughs> in the mouse. Yeah, I, I think his computers, I think they just started with just a screen and keyboard. There was no mouse. And so now he was bringing in the, the mouse, which gave people a lot more flexibility. But of course, all the old people, if they were just used to the keyboards, they were really constrained in what they could do. So even though it pissed people off, he forced them to learn how to use the mouse. This is what Job says. Give customers what they want but that's not my approach. Our job is to figure out what they're going to want before they do. Henry Ford once said, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would ask for a faster horse. People don't know what they want until you show them. That's why I never rely on market research. Our task is to read things that are not yet on that page. So big congrats to Steve and, and to the Apple team. They've got the Apple II. It's going phenomenally. They're selling a lot. They've revolutionized the industry. But Jobs, he's not one to rest on his laurels. He realizes that the, whilst the Apple II is going great, they can't just remain successful forever and keep trying to flog a dead horse and keep trying to sell this and sell this. They got to where they are by innovating. So, of course, they need to take the next step and innovate and create something new. So, whereas the Apple II was widely seen as was as masterpiece right he was the engineer for it steve jobs wanted his own brand on new products so he wanted another quantum leap in computing and this is where he came up with the macintosh so it was really the first computer with a beautiful graphical interface that you know a little bit closer to what we see today but at the time it was probably a little bit ahead of its time and after they invested a lot of money into steve's new idea uh this one wasn't going too well it was under 10,000 sales per month, well below their projections over hundreds of thousands per month. At the same time, they were creating the next masterpiece. So they created this and launched it. His next masterpiece was called the Lisa. Now, Lisa, because Jobs, he was an ultra perfectionist. He wanted design to be perfect. He wanted everything to be perfect. He wanted everything to be clean, look amazing, work amazing. And this uh, obsession with perfection really was costing them a hell of a lot of money. They hadn't even finished this creation yet and it, was, it wasn't it was even about to see the light of day. So in this sort of panicked mode where the Apple II was great but his next thing, the Macintosh, wasn't selling so well, the next thing, the Lisa, hasn't even been finished yet, he started to do some stupid things. What he did was he took this Lisa that they'd created and he rebranded it as a Macintosh emulation program. He sold this thing that was going to be the Lisa and he just changed it to the Mac XL, mm. which was the next version of the Mac, which was just a shitter version basically. Yeah. And you get to think this is very different to when you're in your parents' garage where you got full autonomy, full control over your choice. They're a public company now, so they've got a whole range of investors and then also a board of directors, right? And they've probably got different backgrounds and a different attitude to... Steve, who's still a little bit eccentric, still a bit of a hippie, still stinks and all of that. <laughs> so, obviously, the board are looking at Steve Jobs and he's, he's still this visionary taking all these risks and moving the company forward, which goes against the values of the board, right? They just want to maximize their profit for their mm. shareholders and really, they're the only things that the, the board's after. So, it got to a boiling point where Jobs was just running up costs. He wasn't making sales. His obsession with perfection was really... Uh, really screwing over the company in terms of their profits and their projections and it got to a breaking point where when Jobs was presenting to the board, he said, look, you can back me. I'm going to take full responsibility for running the company and basically he said, as long as I'm running the show, as long as I'm CEO, this is how we're going to do it and he said, look, if you don't back me, then uh, maybe you need to find someone else as CEO and after Jobs left the room, they had a few discussions and I thought, maybe we need to find someone else as CEO. <laughs> yeah, I think Jobs, when he, when he told everyone to put your hand up and back me, <laughs> uh, he was expecting some people to do it. <laughs> but yeah. unfortunately, no one is behind Jobs, right? So Jobs, after inventing Apple computers from the garage with Wozniak, he was essentially fired from his job mm. and told to go elsewhere. Maybe it'd be pretty heartbreaking to be kicked out of your own company that you built from the ground up and all of a sudden other people come in and take over and say, sorry, mate, you're out. Yeah, exactly right. But remember, he's still young, right? So you still got, got a fuckload of money as you well. You got a fuckload yeah. of money, <laughs> you're still young and you got a reputation for computing mm. at this stage. So despite the low point he is here, he again kept with his visions of computing and changing the way things are done and went on to a new venture. That new venture was Next Computing. I suppose it was just his, his next project. I suppose that's what he was thinking was this is the next thing and he wanted to build another computer company. Yeah, the Next was targeted at a more niche market, the higher value, high end in the educational sector. 
but at this stage he still had his obsession with perfect design uh, to the point that he built a fully automated factory which is pretty cool but he made the similar mistakes about hemorrhaging cash like he did when they were building the Macintosh. Even the machines and the robots inside the factory, these were all painted and repainted beyond excessiveness in the areas that no one's going to see. I mean, when you buy the computer, no one's going to see the factory or the robot mm. that built it, are they? Yeah, exactly. But he hemorrhaged costs in these kind of ridiculous places. And I think that idea of perfectionism and clean, perfect design extended beyond what was financially viable here. The walls of the offices in the factory were this perfect museum white. He had these leather chairs and they cost 20 grand each. He even made this custom staircase, which was all out of made out of glass and titanium that he had specially architecturally designed and it was a one-of-a-kind, once-off, bespoke creation. Mm, and worst of all, the product they actually built at his next company, it was, it was crap. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Gates said it was obviously a big competitor throughout Steve Jobs' career. He said, this machine is crap. The optical disc has too high latency. The case is too fucking expensive. The thing is ridiculous. And it's not only that, they charged a ridiculous amount as well. There was a single price of six and a half grand for the computer. The optional disc printer was another two grand. And then you needed another two and a half grand for an external disc. And then worst of all, they were trying to sell this product right all together above 10 grand US for that time back in the day. And when they released it, there's actually no software for it. So basically, you're buying something that you can't even use. (laughs) 10 grand for an empty box and it it wasn't until 12 months later that you'd get the software to be able to run it. Mm. So Jobs, obviously a multimillionaire at the very start, was hemorrhaging cash when it came to his new company started next. And another company that he bought into was Pixar at the same time. So he got 70% of Pixar for a $10 million initial investment. Pixar was this digital animation company Jobs ultimately saw it as a bit of a a sideline thing at first. Really, the purpose of the Pixar company was to show off the hardware and software. So, basically, make really cool shit to say, hey, this is how awesome you can use it. If you want to do this yourself, well, we've got the stuff and you can do it yourself. So, Pixar had three parts of the business. They had digital animation, which is a small part which eventually became you know, what we know it as today. But at the same time, most of their investment was in the hardware and the software of the company. And at the start, even after Jobs invested his money, all three of these endeavors, they were all losing cash and losing more cash. And the hardware and software and the animated content all together were going downhill. And still, Jobs kept pouring more and more of his money into these projects. And after his original failure at Next, which we spoke about, He couldn't afford another strike at this stage. He was burning through too much cash. So to stem the losses, he ordered a round of layoffs um, with his typical empathy deficiency. (laughs) Yeah, well, as we've briefly touched on that as a person, as a character, he was very abrasive, very much to the point. He didn't have the financial runway to be able to keep paying these people, but at the same time, he didn't have the emotional empathy to be able to do it in a good way so what he actually said to these people when he was laying off half of the staff he said look i'm I'm giving you guys two weeks notice which is you know everyone has to give two weeks notice when they fire someone but he said look this notice uh it's actually going to go in retroactively the notice period started two weeks ago so today's your last day (laughs) (laughs) mate that's just unheard of isn't it i don't think you're allowed to do that (laughs) so after getting fired from the original company built at apple he went on to start next a company and that was an utter failure and he was hemorrhaging cash at that. And then Pixar, where he invested his money and poured more and more money in the tens and tens of millions, another huge failure. So Steve Jobs, he went up the whole ladder of success. And then at this stage, he really went into the, the belly of the whale and was going to a failure and almost lost his entire fortune and everything that he worked so hard to get. That's it. So he's gone from investing 500 bucks from the calculator he sold all the way to within four years, he becomes an overnight um success with 250 million in shares and then it started to erode where he's, he's lost Apple, he's lost money at Next, he's, lo- he's invested 50 million into Pixar and it's not looking any good. So he's really in this real period of pain. Now, drawing back to a, a book we did, Principles by Ray Dalio, he said that it's vital that with pain, if you can add reflection to that, you can actually get progress. Obviously, everyone goes through bad times, but it's the ones who can take a step back, take some learnings from it, who are able to progress out the other side a better person. And if you're going after ambitious goals like a, a Steve Jobs mm. is, sometimes you might get successful like you did at the start, but in every project, there's there's a real chance that your ambition is way too far and you can't be implemented. 
and the failure is going to be an inevitable part of the journey that you're on because you're just pushing yourself past your limits all the time and failing and sometimes breakthrough are kind of inevitable and you can derive the benefits of both the success and the failure. But if you push through this painful process of this personal evolution, you're naturally going to send higher and higher. There's another book that we haven't done on the podcast yet. I've been reading one page each day, uh, The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday. And one of the things is saying that, you know, stoicism, it's all about, look, the bad times, you know, the obstacle is the way. If there's bad times, then you can find some kind of opportunity in that. And what in The Daily Stoic, one of the, one of the passages, he was saying that it's crazy to want to experience failure. It's crazy to want to have bad times, but it's also crazy to be oblivious to them in the sense that there's always bad times going to happen. You shouldn't be praying that bad times come your way, but you should be expecting, hey, there is going to be some bad times coming. At some point, I am going to have failure. So you need to be prepared to take that lesson, to take that reflection and to progress through and out the other side. I think it is very common. Every successful entrepreneur or every leader around the world, if you look into their story, all of them have a serious belly of the whale moment. It happened with Ray Dalio. It happened with Steve Jobs here. If you look at Someone like Elon Musk, he had his trough when SpaceX and Tesla were just living by the knife edge. So like you were saying, like Ryan Holiday, in a weird way, it kind of is a good thing if you're going to have a successful journey. So at this stage, Steve is in the belly of the whale. So the way he's living, there are real risks and the hero can fall into these low points in life. But with the real risk, there is also the opportunity of real reward. That's just that light at the end of the tunnel that could be coming around the corner. And at these low points, it's a real opportunity to go inward and be reborn again and take some learnings and lessons uh, into the new endeavors that you take on. Of course, if the story ended with uh, three failures, we probably wouldn't be talking about it today. But let's start with Pixar. An employee at Pixar pitched this idea for a new film that they could talk about. He talked about the idea that objects, the things around us, they have feelings too and their feelings are based on how well they are delivering their their purpose or their, their value. So as an example, a glass, its purpose is to hold water. So when the glass is full, it will be happy. When the glass is empty, it will be sad. So that was like a, an example he used to bridge it. And he said, well, what about toys? So for toys... Their purpose is for kids to play with them. So if the toys are being played with, they're happy. If the toys are sitting at the bottom of the toy box, then they're sad. So that was sort of the idea of, of course, a big, massive, world-famous success, Toy Story. So this stage, Jobs was still hemorrhaging through his cash and he hemorrhaged loads of it through Toy Story, putting it through many iterations and it was a form of torture for everybody else who was dealing with it. He had the obsession that everything had to be right and perfect including the story and the technology, and he wasn't satisfied with anything less than perfection. So this perfectionism trait, it's worked both for and against him. At the start, when they were creating an Apple II, making the perfect product, that's what enabled it to be successful. That's what enabled them to sell 6 million brand new computers. But then later on with the Macintosh and with Next, perfectionism was working against him. He was just hemorrhaging cash. They couldn't finish a product. They couldn't get any sales for the Lisa as well. Whereas now the perfectionism, he's still carrying that through, but I guess it's a tempered perfectionism. He's getting it to the point where the the movie is perfect and he wants it to be a success. So Jobs put huge bets on the success of Toy Story. He actually prolonged the IPO, waiting until the launch of the actual movie, hoping that if the movie's a success, then the IPO will be a success and then Jobs, uh, he'll recoup all, all of his losses of his past failures. It was a big bet. It was a big risk because they could have played it safe and IPO'd before Toy Story and really sold it on the hype and the hope. Whereas if you wait till after, if it flops, then the IPO is screwed. If it goes really well, obviously, then he participates in the upside there. Thankfully for Jobs, the perfectionism that was Toy Story when it launched in 1995 was a massive success. The first weekend, it raked in $30 million in the domestic opening, and that fully paid for the movie. It recouped all of the costs. It beat Batman, it beat Apollo 13, and for that first year alone, it pulled in 362 million worldwide. And of course, after this massive, massive success, when the IPO comes around, the price, when it first launched, opens at $22. By the end of the first day, it closed at $39. Jobs owned 80% of Pixar and from that one day alone, he's now worth $1.2 billion. 
I like how we said that one day alone. Of course, it was like five years of building up and making this uh, big, big bets and big, big risks. But yeah, in one night, mm. billionaire. Exactly. That's that's right. It's playing in the world of huge risks where it's uh, you can be massive a failure or in a massive success. And I think the perfectionism is the thing that really helped him at the start and then it was the cause of his biggest failure, like, like spending unnecessary money on things like we were mentioning. And now that perfectionism in this world of the high risk, high reward actually was the thing that actually paid off with Toy Story. So Jobs, at this stage, he's a success again. He's got $1.2 billion really of working capital to, to deploy in any way he really wanted. And he still had this affinity with the computer industry and he really despaired that innovation had virtually ceased in that area. I mean, he had his big dreams about what computers are going to be today and they all suck basically, everyone in, in that area, Microsoft, including Apple, his old company. He's got a big quote here where he says, I have my own theory why decline happens in big companies like IBM or Microsoft. The company does a great job, they innovate, they become a monopoly or close to it in some field, but then the quality of the product becomes less important. The company starts valuing the great salesmen because they're the ones who can move the needle on revenues, not the product engineers and designers. So the salespeople start running the company. When the sales guys run the company, the product doesn't matter so much and a lot of them just turn off. It happened at Apple when Scully came in, which was my fault being Steve Jobs, and it happened when Ballmer took over Microsoft. And this is what happened at Apple when he was the original innovator, all the management team and the board, they got rid of him and they just focused on sales and increasing just the profit share and that's it. But ironically, they had the profit gains in the short term, but over the long term in the five to 10 year kind of horizon, they lost more and more market share. So they were dominating the industry originally, but at this stage after his success at Pixar, he noticed that they were down to only 4% market share. And Jobs said they just cared about making money for themselves, but mainly also for Apple rather than making great products. So Apple's been sliding down. They thought that it was Jobs was spending too much money and he was wasting all this money and they thought if we get rid of Jobs, we can do it our way and it'll be better. But even after Jobs left, it wasn't turning up around. They thought, okay, what can we do next? It's looking like we've got an 80% chance of failure if we continue down the path we're continuing on. The other option, which is a wild option, can we bring Steve Jobs back and maybe there's still a 50% chance that we fail, but we've just increased our chance of success significantly. There's some strategizing going on where it ends up that Apple buys Jobs' next computer, which allows them to bring Jobs back in as the CEO. And as part of the deal, Jobs brings in some seriously strong leaders to add to the Apple board. He brings in Al Gore. He brings in Eric Schmidt. He brings in Art Levinson. He brings in a whole bunch of guys that are, I guess, on his side and on his team that he feels that he can confidently and comfortably rebuild Apple back to the success that it once was. So Jobs now, he's got a board behind him and he's got a bit more autonomy about how he's going to run things. The first thing he went for is product reviews. And one of his greatest strengths that we've figured out is his ability to know how to focus and deciding what not to do is as important as deciding what to do. And that's true for companies and it's true for products. Yeah, I know there's a, an often quoted, you know, there's a job said he's happier with a thousand awesome ideas that they said no to so they could focus on those three or four amazing ones. When he comes back into Apple after his layoff, he's found that they've got, they don't just have the Macintosh, they've got 12 different versions of the Macintosh. He says there's tons of products, most of them are crap, most of them are made by these deluded teams that don't know what they're doing, they don't have a vision for where they're headed. And Steve Jobs, when he sees 12 different Macs, he just asks, you know, which one should I recommend to my friends and why? There's a real paradox of choice if you've got 12 different slight subtle variations of the same thing. Exactly. It's kind of this bureaucratic momentum that all these execs in the boardroom were just going along with. And after a few weeks, he, th he said, stop, this is crazy. And he went to the whiteboard and he grabbed a magic marker, just drew a horizontal and a vertical line, so it was a four-squared chart. And he said, this is what we need. We just need consumer and we need pro. And then the other two rows were desktop and portable. So whereas they previously had dozens and dozens of different product lines, now he just wanted them to focus on only four products. That's it. So they're going to do it consumer desktop, a consumer portable, a pro desktop and a pro portable. Just those four simple things, they're going to forget about having the 12 different variations. They're just going to think, okay, we're making four products and these are what they need to be. The second major change he implemented was the design should lead engineering and not the other way around. 
So for most other companies in the computer industries, is the, the engineers would go off and design a product and then whatever the product looks like, the designers come in after and they just try and shape everything around what the engineering box has. But Jobs brought in a guy who's now a legend is Johnny Ive and the principle for them was that they need to start on beautiful designs and get rid of everything in the design that's not absolutely essential and this required collaboration between the designers, the product developers, and the engineers in the manufacturing team to fit this design that John would come up with. And the third big change was he wanted to revolutionize the marketing. No CEO on the planet took as much interest in marketing as Steve Jobs did. You would have seen his amazing product launches. You saw it with the Apple II. There was a, a big ad campaign, the 1984 ad at the Super Bowl, which was another massive one. They started to drift away from that and it became a little bit too structured, a little bit too stale and clean. He wanted to come back with another big marketing campaign. And this is where they brought out the Think Different campaign. Jobs himself, growing up, he was a misfit and a rebel. And this category of person is the type of person that Steve Jobs wanted to serve with Apple products. So his final words were, he said, we too are going to think differently and serve the people who have been buying our products from the beginning because a lot of people think they are crazy, but in that craziness, we see genius. Then they spread this Think Different campaign everywhere on print and TV media. It said, here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world, they're the ones that do. So Jobs is back at the helm. The rest is history. There's a hell of a lot of incredible innovations and creations after this. We're going to highlight some of the ultimate products that he brought to the world, which when you're looking back in this short you know, six-minute segment where we're going to rattle off a few of his amazing successes, that's some seriously world-changing shit over the course of a couple of decades. Yeah, you forget how much Steve Jobs actually did in his uh, short life that he had in the end. The first one's the iMac. Now, this is the big, their first real big product after this Think Different campaign. So, this is where he really was able to you know, think different, bring the things we talked about with him and Johnny Ive and the design and bring something new and innovative back to Apple. So, remember how much Steve Jobs was obsessed with the design of things, even if the consumer can't even see it? This time it actually paid in their favor because they made the back of the, the computer case translucent so you could see inside and you can see the beautiful alignment of all the chips and the electronics in the back end of, of the product. They also made them different colors. He had this sea green color. He had this Bondi blue color. They had all these different colors of this translucent case where you could, on one hand, you could see inside, but on the other hand, you had these bright and distinctive colors. And at the launch in 1998, he was very good at storytelling and doing enough and building the tension as he released the product. And at the launch, he said, this is what the computers look like today. And he showed a set of boxy components and a monitor projected on a big screen. It was actually what they looked like yeah, that day. Just this old boxy, gray, pretty standard sort of stuff. Mm. And then he said, I'd like the privilege of showing you what they're going to look like from today onwards. And he pulled off the cloth and he revealed the Mac and it gleamed and sparkled as the lights came on cue. And it was an iconic new product, the harbinger of a new millennium. And it all fulfilled the promise of think different. Instead of the beige boxes and the welter of cables, it really did look at something that challenged the status quo. It had a spunky kind of and friendly appliance. It was smooth to touch. And previously, people who were afraid of computers because they were just boring and looked like a box, this one really did appeal to the artists and the rebels and the creative side of people. When it went on sale in August 1998, they sold almost 300,000 units in their first week, 800,000 by the end of that year, and it became the fastest selling computer in Apple's history. 32% of sales went to people who were buying a computer for the first time. So as you said, it wasn't like these, these were already Apple people who just bought the new Apple. A third of the sales were to people who had never bought a computer before. And also probably a nice one for Steve, 12% of those people, they used to own a Windows and they sort of ditched Microsoft and, and jumped over to Apple. The next product he looked to build was a portable music player. So he met with Toshiba engineers and 
they had come up with a 1.8 inch drive, which was a real revolution in electronics and it could hold about five gigabytes. And the Toshiba engineers like, what the hell can we do with this amazing, <laughs> uh, you know, piece of hardware? But Steve Jobs, the guy who had the, the bridge between marketing, engineering and design, he thought that five gigabytes, that's 1,000 songs. You know, a very simple message he used to market the iPod. A few other core elements of this iPod that made it different was firstly they had, a, again, strict simplicity about the user experience. They said to get to any song, you have to have absolute maximum three clicks. So from the homepage to get to any song you want has to be three clicks or less. Another thing was he hated the on-off switch. You'll notice that there was, there was never any on-off switches. That was where the, you know, if you don't touch it for a minute, it just turns itself off compared to having to forcefully turn it off. And another one was that, that track wheel. So rather than confusing clunky buttons, they had that nice smooth track wheel. So the iPod really revolutionized the way we access our music. And piggybacking off that, he launched the iTunes Store, which could really be part of a digital hub uh, along the iPod. So if you think back in the day when the music industry was facing the challenge, I mean, you could go to, the, to your local music store and buy a CD for 30 bucks, mm. or you can go and download Napster or Kazaa or get, and get any kind of song you want for free and you just rip it onto a, a 99 cent disc. So basically all the artists out there were getting no, no, none of the revenue for the art that they were making. So what Jobs wanted to do, he respected the artists and the craftsmen and, and the designers. He thought it was just an absolute shambles that these illegal piracy companies would come in and undercut. But at the same time, he recognized that the old school way of you have to buy a total, a full album, you have to pay 30 bucks, you have to go to a record store. He realized that that's not good either. So he needed to find some legal way to get the best of both worlds. He had the opinion that 80% of the people who were stealing the music didn't actually want to. There was just no other way they could do it. So instead, they create the iTunes store. Rather than going on one of these dodgy sites and spending an hour downloading it, the iTunes store allowed you to get it within one minute. You could download a song and it was only going to be a couple of bucks. So in 2005, the iPod sales were skyrocketing alongside iTunes. They were kind of leveraging off each other and were a massive source of revenue for Apple. And iPods alone, they accounted for 45% of all their revenue that year. And when they were doing their meetings, Jobs realized that the only thing that could eat their lunch and steal their whole entire market share of their iPod is the phone. Because he saw that digital cameras were already being decimated by phones. I remember the early phones, they had cameras, everyone stopped buying digital cameras. And he realized that the same thing could happen to the iPod. One day on your phone, you'll be able to access your own music. So they've got almost half of their revenues come from this one product, the iPod. And he's saying that you know, we don't want to be stuck in just flogging iPods. We don't want to become the the Kodaks where we're just so fixed on flogging the old analog cameras with film and stuff that we are so attached to it that we die out. So he says that if we don't cannibalize ourselves, somebody else will. So in a sense, you have to realize that the only way to stop yourself from being killed by somebody else was to really kill yourself. So he went about trying to kill the iPod by doing the next evolution and the next iteration. So Jobs being the one who wanted to cannibalize himself, he realized that there's a huge revolution that needed to happen with phones. And he thought that the thing that everyone wants is multi-touch screen displays and people at that stage remember what phones were like back then. That's a huge jump from having the phone with the buttons to having something that you could actually touch with multiple times at the same time. And this feature called multi-touch required multiple inputs at once, which was a huge engineering challenge at the time. But at the same time, because of Steve's reality distortion field, something that seemed impossible to most people, the engineers were able to deliver it in record or a wild time frame of only six months. Now again, Steve being the master presenter and the master marketer and the master hype man that he is, at their big annual conference, he said, every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. Today, we're introducing three. The first is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communication device. He repeated it for emphasis. He listed those three things. And then he said, but we're not releasing three separate devices here. This is all one device and we're calling it the iPhone. I think it's worth everyone watching that video because it did just change the world really in mm. that, with that one product. And obviously, the iPhone was the biggest out of all of, his, all of his successes, I'd say. By the end of 2010, they'd sold 90 million iPhones and took half the total profits of the whole entire global cell phone market. 
Another thing that came off the back of this was apps. So with the iPod, they also brought the iTunes store along with it. Now with the iPhone, they brought the app store along with it. Now the app store opened in 2008. Nine months later, they'd had their one billionth app download and the app store really spun off an entire new industry overnight. So suddenly you've got all these entrepreneurs and all these creators and all these tech heads that are able to now tap into this new industry where they're creating apps and selling them on the iPhone. And two years later, after the app store launched, Apple had paid out $2.5 billion to those people who had developed the apps. So Apple had released the iMac, the iPod, the iTunes store, the iPhone, the iPhone apps in a pretty short period of time and all at the exact same time is other little side hobby on the side, <laughs> Pixar, they were absolutely killing it as well. Your know, Bugs Life here, they grossed $363 million in their first year worldwide. Toy Story 2 grossed $485 million worldwide. Monsters Inc, $525 million and Finding Nemo, $868 million worldwide. That's not bad. If if you're he was the CEO of both companies at the same <laughs> not bad, time, mate. I wouldn't know. Wouldn't mind. <laughs> wouldn't mind so, that either. <laughs> so you've just gone the biggest music player ever in the iPod. You've revolutionised the music industry. You've just created a, the first ever smartphones. You brought the internet plus music plus phones all together. You got the App Store. That was just one company. He's got his second side company where he's also the CEO of. That's just done billions of dollars in revenue from these massive, massive, world changing movies. Despite the fact that he changed the world and the wild success he had in the process, he is human, so he is vulnerable to the the trials and tribulations that all of us have to deal with. And one day he got scans on his kidneys and it showed a shadow on his pancreas. And the nurse asked Jobs, go and get a pancreatic study. Uh, there's a real risk here. There's something not going right. And originally he didn't because he had his uh, willfully ignorant inputs that he did not want to process a, a part of his or a negative part of his reality distortion field and eventually she persisted and persisted and they found a tumor so that reality distortion field that we we mentioned before he's able to shift other people's perception of themselves but at the same time he distorts his own reality if there's anything that comes in any facts that comes in that he doesn't agree with or he doesn't like he just ignores them so this is one he put off a long time having to get these tests in the first place and then he also then put off some of the facts around what should he do next. He One piece of medical advice was to have surgery and remove it, try and catch it while it's early before it spreads. But Job said, look, I, I don't want it to open up my body. There's probably more risks associated and I want to try a few other things. So he went on this strictly vegan diet, drank a lot of fresh carrot juice. He tried all these different various treatments like bowel cleansers and hydrotherapy and some mental things like trying to get rid of all of his negative feelings. His reality distortion field says that he can almost will the cancer away by trying some of these alternative approaches. Yeah, he was asked to eat a nutritious diet, a mix of vegetables, meat and fish products and do a few certain things to increase the odds that he's going to survive. But he didn't do any of that. And his cancer spread because of it when his immune system was shot because he was also working so hard uh, in the years leading up to this moment. So Steve Jobs, the day had come, he died on the 5th of October, 2011. There was that very famous Stanford commencement address. The author of this biography, Walter Isaacson, said, you're never going to see a better, more impactful commencement speech than this. And one of the key passages from that address Steve said that remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big decisions in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, pride, fear, embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. Hey everyone, if you liked that episode and you got some friends in your network who you think will benefit from the book, give it a share on social media so they'll hear about it and we'll love to hear from you also.